Good evening to you, and let me welcome you first of all to our evening service here at Gilcomson Church. I know that many of you um, look in and uh, are glad to join us from any number of different parts, both of the country and uh, far beyond as well. So wherever you are this evening and whatever your circumstances, a very warm welcome to you. And we do trust and pray always that you will meet with the Lord and know his ministering to you according to your need as together we gather before him and bring to him our praise tonight. We're going to begin that worship of God by joining to sing together the hymn, uh, lift up your voice, uh, O heavens rejoice, the Lord is King. Let us worship God. Let us then join together now in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Gracious God, our Father, we gladly bow in your presence, glad to acknowledge that you are indeed the Lord omnipotent, that to you belongs all authority in heaven and on earth. This is your world. You made it, you run it, you love it, and you have come to it. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your every mercy towards us. We thank you for your great patience towards us. We thank you, our Father, for every way in which you have seen our need. You have spoken into our circumstances and in the power of your Holy Spirit. You have been pleased to apply to our hearts and lives the gracious work of your risen Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and afford to us in him a life that is new, a relationship with yourself in which we're able to draw near to you and know you as our Father in heaven. You open to us a whole new future, gracious God, that lies beyond this world with all its perplexities, all its confusion, all its many uncertainties and all its sorrows. We thank you that you have purposed for us and promised to us a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness alone dwells. And for every way in which even in and through this earthly life we're conscious of your presence with us and your hand upon us, your protection around us and your provision for us. We gladly give you thanks again as we gather and join in worship before your throne tonight. 
We thank you, living God, for every way in which you assure us that you go before us into all that coming days will bring. And you exercise always your sovereign grace in the dealings that you have with us and indeed with your world. And yet we bow our gracious God before the majesty of your own being, acknowledging that you are indeed altogether holy and righteous, and you deal always justly as well as mercifully. We tremble therefore in your presence, gracious God, and pray that you would draw near to us and grant to us in our worship that which exalts your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that which brings pleasure as well as honor to your own holy heart. And grant, living God, that in your kindness, even as we lift to you the praises of our hearts and open to you again our hearts to receive all that you mean to be and give to us, so will you come by your Holy Spirit and grant to us your blessing, refreshing us, renewing us, restoring us, re-energizing and reinvigorating us, living God, for the living of these days. We need your help. We need your strength. We need your forgiveness. We need your renewal. Would you come, Heavenly Father, and deal graciously and bountifully with us? For we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we continue in our praise of God by singing a hymn written first by Samuel Rutherford, who for many a year was in exile here in Aberdeen and who uh, exercised really a very profound ministry through the correspondence in which he engaged from here. Uh, the letters became his pulpit in many ways where he proclaimed and applied the, the word of God. And he wrote this hymn called The Sands of Time Are Sinking underlining the immediacy and urgency always of the call of the gospel and at the same time pointing us beyond this earthly life to that which is far better, a new heavens, new earth, Emmanuel's land where at last all shall be right. Let us join in singing the sands of time are sinking.
Well, we turn in a moment to the Word of God to read first of all and then to learn from the passage in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, if you have a Bible to hand, uh, then uh, do please uh, get a hold of one so that uh, you're able to follow the reading. Uh, it's going to be read for us this evening by Paul, who's uh, out in Africa. He teaches in a seminary out there, training pastors. Uh, to uh, serve the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he reads the scripture and you see the backdrop, uh, that is for real, that's not a virtual backdrop. And we're delighted that Paul's able to join us this evening and read the scripture for us. And so without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Paul. The reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 21 from verses 1 to 14. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Asher, son of Malchiah, and the priest Zephaniah, son of Messiah. They said, inquire now of the Lord for us, because Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is attacking us. Perhaps the Lord will perform wonders for us, as in times past so that he will withdraw from us. But Jeremiah answered them, Tell Zedekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I am about to turn against you the weapons of war that are in your hands, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the wall besieging you. And I will gather them inside the city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched arm and a mighty arm in anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike down those who live in this city, both men and animal, and they will die of a terrible plague. After that, declares the Lord, I will hand over Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials, and the people in this city who survived the plague, sword and famine to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to their enemies who seek their lives. He will put them to the sword. He will show them no mercy or pity or compassion. Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says. See, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. He will escape with his life. I have determined to do this city harm and not good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon and he will destroy it with fire. Moreover, say to the royal house of Judah, hear the word of the Lord, O house of David. This is what the Lord says. Administer justice every morning. Rescue from the hand of his oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Or my wrath will break out and burn like fire. Because of the evil you have done, burn with no one to quench it. I am against you, Jerusalem. You who live above this valley on the rocky plateau, declares the Lord. You who say, who can come against us? Who can enter our refuge? I will punish you as your deeds deserve, declares the Lord. I will kindle a fire in your forests that will consume everything around you. Well, as we turn to uh, look at and study the, the word of God, we'll ask God himself to teach us from his words that we've just had read for us. Let us pray. God, our Father, we, we would never presume simply to be able to view your word, to read it, to hear it, to ponder it, as though somehow we were viewing an object of interest. We come living God and place ourselves beneath your word, that you would speak that word into our hearts, that you would come by your Holy Spirit and illumine our minds, giving to us understanding as we apply ourselves to the study of your word, 
May we find that you yourself, the author of that word, are applying your word to our hearts and lives. Help us, therefore, living God, to come with open ears, to hear what it is that you have to say. Help us as we get to grips with the scriptures to be gripped by them in a way that will see us mastered by your Son and intent on living out our days, whatever the context, for his praise and glory. And this we ask for his name's sake. Amen. Well, these are, uh, without a question, they are very strange days. We're all very conscious of that. And the longer the lockdown goes on, the longer the restrictions are in place, the longer all the ramifications of that persist, the more we realize just how strange they are. We don't take easily or kindly to them, therefore. But as well as recognizing that they are strange days, I imagine that many of you probably recognize as well that in ways beyond our understanding at present, they are surely also significant. It may be that only in the fullness of time will we be able really to comprehend precisely what the significance of them is. At the moment, we simply perhaps recognize that they are significant days. And there is certainly a sense of uh, urgency, a sense of foreboding that lies behind the uncertainty that hangs like a cloud over the experience of so many in these days. And in such times, as always, we turn to the, the Word of God, conscious that the living God who made this world, the God who is Lord of all history, continues in the mystery of his remarkable dealings. He continues to speak with a great immediacy into our lives and into our circumstances in such a manner that although the scriptures that we'll read and that we'll look at this evening were first scribed and penned thousands of years ago in, in a very different context, they, they suddenly have an immediacy of application to ourselves today as well. And it's for that reason that we, we take a little bit of time working our way through this chapter in the book of Jeremiah, which uh, is structured uh, in a very simple fashion around the repeated phrase, tell the rulers, tell the king, first of all, Zedekiah, verses 1 to 7, then tell the people, verses 8 to 10, and then tell the royal house of Judah, verses 11 to 14. That's really the, the structure or the framework of the chapter, and it provides a helpful framework for us. Last Sunday evening, we looked at the first seven verses where essentially uh, the Lord is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah to what I termed the rulers. Um, there are three mentioned there, uh, the king Zedekiah, uh, the uh, royal official, uh, a man called Pasha, and the priest, a man called Zephaniah. And in many ways, combined together, they, they are what I call the rulers because they are the ones who shape the culture in which they live back then and in which we also ourselves now live. There are those who, who make the rules, the king. There are those who set the agenda, uh, the, the kind of chattering classes, as it were. And there are those who bring the religious stamp of approval, who kind of bless the prevailing philosophy as well. And that combination helps to shape a culture. And the Lord had, at this particular juncture in time, a very clear, powerful word to the rulers that we saw last time. And that word was very simple. It was, um, know your foe. Recognize who you are contending against at the particular time in which Jeremiah was writing. Probably in round about 588 BC when uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had marched up against Jerusalem and was now threatening to overthrow the city of God, overthrow Jerusalem. That's the context, and the king and the, uh, the officials, they are very conscious of that particular danger, that particular threat. And Jeremiah is simply saying to them, you may think that that's the real threat, but it's not. The real threat is, uh, is not Nebuchadnezzar. It's not him that you're fighting against. It is the Lord himself who you are fighting against, who therefore you are finding is fighting against you. And it's a 
total mismatch. He says, you don't want to come up against the living God. You are no match at all. Whatever you might think in terms of how you're going to fare with Nebuchadnezzar, there is no way that you are going to be able to contend against the Lord himself. Now, we, we take that on board and recognize that uh, although it's not the king of Babylon uh, who is besieging us, we are a nation, like so many others at this time, under siege. There is a very real threat that is devastating in its consequences and against which we, we don't have an answer at this present time, and it occasions death in significant numbers. We're very conscious of that. And to the rulers in our society, to those who shape the culture today, whether it's those who make the rules, who set the agenda, or who kind of bring the religious stamp of approval to bear upon the current prevailing philosophy, Jeremiah's message is just as pertinent today. Uh, know who it is that you're up against. You're, you're not contending against the coronavirus, ultimately. Uh, you have been contending against God himself. Now, that's the, the first seven verses that we looked at last Sunday evening where Jeremiah is bring, really bringing the word of God to bear upon the rulers. This middle section that we're going to look at this evening is the word that the Lord addresses to the people. Furthermore, he says, tell the people. Uh, this is the Lord speaking through Jeremiah and saying, I have a message for the people. And so this evening, um, I have entitled the, uh, the message of these verses as an open letter to the people of Scotland. A message uh, from the Lord that he means the people of this land, this nation, to hear and to heed, just as he spoke very directly to the people of Judah back then. We, we can't afford the luxury of simply sitting back as we read this passage, sitting back and looking back over a couple of thousand years and more to the time of Jeremiah and viewing what happened there as though it was somehow very distant and very remote from us. It has an immediacy um, insofar as the Lord who addressed that open letter to the people of Judah back then addresses uh, his word, an open letter to the people of Scotland today. You could broaden it out, I suppose, if you, if you think that's too insular and think in terms of the United Kingdom, you could speak of it in terms of perhaps the nation of which you are a part. Whatever context you were, uh, just recognize the immediacy of this. This is the Lord speaking to the people. And it's prefaced by these words, furthermore, tell the people of the land. Um, and this is what the Lord has been doing for long enough. Uh, we need to, to recognize that when we read these words, furthermore, on top of that, yet again, the Lord's saying, tell the people of the land. Um, tell the people again, because he has been speaking to the people over long, long years. Uh, when the, uh, the writer of the book of Chronicles, the two books of Chronicles there, uh, when he begins to round off all the analysis of the story of the people of Judah down through the years that culminated in their being defeated, being overthrown by Nebuchadnezzar and being taken into exile, towards the end, he writes this as an analysis, a summary of what had been happening. Chapter 36 of Second Chronicles. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. Now, when you read this chapter in Jeremiah, um, you really need to have that, uh, that kind of broad brush stroke backdrop to all that is going on here before you start uh, uh, complaining about Jeremiah and saying, hey, that's, that's kind of harsh, the message that you're bringing there. You, you need to set it against this backdrop that the Lord himself uh, again and again sent word to them through his messengers and did so out of his pity. That's what we're told, out of his compassion. It is because the Lord cares for the people of the land. 
He cares for this people who themselves now increasingly have been suffering under the rulers, under the, the line that those who shape the culture have been fashioning for them. They are the ones, the people of the land, who bear the, the repercussions of the, the new morality, the new culture that has been brought in and that has led them all astray. The Lord has compassion. The Lord sees where it leads. He sees the problems that it issues in. He sees the way in which the, uh, the, the abuse of drugs, the, the prevalence of, uh, of all sorts of different things in our society, in a very, very permissive society that is sought to be very avant-garde, that has said there is no truth at all. Whatever is true for you, that's the truth that there is. There aren't any things that are right and things that are wrong. There are only things that feel good and feel not so good and so on and so forth. That whole prevailing culture, the Lord says, that, that has devastatingly damaging effects. And God has compassion upon a people who suffer in the wake of that culture and all that it brings. And the Lord has compassion upon the people of our land today in the wake of all the different ways in which our society has been devastated and damaged in so many different regards by the culture over the course of these past decades. Many, many decades of a culture that has increasingly taken root and uh, is so very distant from and, and far from the truths of the living God. And, and we see it in so many different areas of our lives today. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, the number of individuals for whom it's generations back since they had any sort of exposure to the truth of God at all. The, the number of individuals, uh, the number of children growing up in our society who are basically homeless, not because they don't have a roof over their head, but because they, they just don't know which of the many houses in which they live as they're moved around, shifted around from one mother to another, from one father to another, and so on and so forth. They don't know which is their home at all. They, they don't have a home. They just have a roof over their head at best. There are all manner of different consequences that have flowed from the culture that has been formed by uh, the rulers in our society over these past many, many decades. You can trace it back probably 100 years anyway uh, and see the, the gradual way in which a whole new culture has been shaped and uh, its damaging, damaging consequences. Uh, and the Lord says, but he has pity on them. And the pity that the Lord has is given expression in the way in which he sends to them messengers. Uh, again and again, the Lord says in Second Chronicles chapter 36, again and again the Lord sent them messengers because he had that pity. The, the extraordinary patience of God for the, the people of Judah here, it had been a hundred years and more that they had had some of the great, great heavyweights of the Bible, those who, who bring some of the, the finest passages of Scripture to us, were brought to them, to the people of Judah, sent to them by by God, by a God who cared for them, a God who had compassion on them, a God who longed that they might indeed see the folly of their ways and return to himself. And therefore he sent them a guy like Isaiah. He sent them a guy like Micah. He sent to them the prophets of old in that manner who brought the powerful, clear, blistering sometimes, but sometimes hugely exalting word of God with an authority, with a grace, with a truth, with a directness that was from God himself. God sent these messengers to them in his patience and his patience always is with a view that men and women might see the folly of their ways, might repent of their evil ways and might turn in their eyes being open to seeing how, how much of a dead end it is that they are heading down to turn to the one who alone can be their savior, to turn back to them. As Peter puts it at the end of his uh, second letter in chapter three, he says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, it's important that we, we see this before we kind of rush into what the Lord is saying to the people here. That's the backdrop. A God who has pity on the people, who sees the way in which these people are being sucked along 
in the, the wake of the, the rulers, those who shape the culture, are dragging along behind them a people who simply follow where they are led and the Lord has pity on the people and in that pity very patiently again and again and again sends his messengers to them with his word that is designed to lead them to repentance because he he has no pleasure in the death of any not wanting any to perish but that all might come to repentance to that point where they turn from the direction in which they've been living and turn back to himself, the one who is their God, their maker, their savior, who alone is able to meet them in their need. And if that was true for the people of Judah, it is certainly true for the people of Scotland today who are getting sucked along in the wake of those who have shaped a very, very different culture from that which uh, historically has been our, our roots. God pities the people of this land today. And over these past generations, for the past almost 100 years, we might say as well, as it had been with Judah, because uh, uh, back in the time of, of Hezekiah was when the prophet Isaiah came, 100 years of, of that constant ministry from those who are sent by God over the course of these past 75 years or so in Scotland, God has raised up and has sent to the people of Scotland succeeding ministers of his word who will stand on the truth of that word, who will expound that word, who will declare that word and teach its truth and has, has sent those individuals all over the land, north, south, east and west, has filled the land with those who are sent with the word of God in his pity and in his compassion in order that this people might be brought to see the error of their ways and brought back to himself. And succeeding generations may well have occasion to look back over the course of these years in our land with the benefit of hindsight, with the benefit of, of all that they have learned perhaps through the mistakes that have been made and look back and see that what the Lord said about Judah here, that the Lord, the God of their ancestors sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on them has been the truth about these past 75 years or so in our land God patient patiently bringing his message bringing his word bringing his truth to bear upon the people of our land but they mocked God's messengers they despised his words and they scoffed his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people and there was no remedy. No remedy because the only remedy is the one that they have turned aside from. The only remedy that there is is the one they have scoffed and scorned and despised and rejected. And that's a dreadful place to be at and Judah was pretty much at that point in this passage, at this juncture in time. And it may well be that in the, the, the hindsight of history, we'll see that that's where we are at this time of coronavirus in Scotland. When everything is brought to a standstill, when it's almost as if the Lord just puts his foot down and says, hey, quit everything else that you are doing, everything else that you are occupying your minds and attention with, just stop long enough to hear what I am saying to you. Because there is that immediacy, there is that urgency about the situation. And I have something to say to the people of this land. And so over against the compassion of God, furthermore, tell the people of the land, over against the compassion of the Lord, there is the choice to be made by ourselves. The choice to be made by the people. And that, you'll see, is what Jeremiah's word to them essentially are on about. This is what the Lord says. See, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. There's a sense in which he is, he is simply going over the top of the heads of the rulers. 
going over the top of the heads of the, the ones who shape the culture, those who make the rules, those who set the agenda, those who, who bring the, the various different areas of authority, the kind of legal authority and political authority and cultural authority and spiritual authority to bear upon the culture of a nation. Just going over the heads of all of these guys and saying, listen, I know what they're saying. And I've spoken to them. Now I'm speaking to you, the people. You don't have to follow where they're leading. You don't have to go the way that they are uh, bidding you go. You don't have to embrace the culture that they are imposing on you. You don't have to bow before them and accept what they are saying. You don't have to conform in that way. There is an urgency about the message that is being spoken to the people now. The people who hitherto have simply been sucked along almost unthinkingly and, uh, and without really daring to resist that because this is the way that the crowd is going. This is the way society is going. This is the way that history, they are told, is going. You don't want to be on the wrong side of history. And so they just follow suit and the Lord comes over the top of all of that and says, you don't have to follow like that. You don't have to go where they're going. I have something to say to you and the choice is before them like that. You don't have to accept the dictate that says you are not really Scottish if you don't embrace the values that the Scottish government imposes on you, which is a line that has been pushed. You don't have to bow the knee as a parent and, and simply accept and embrace the philosophy, the, the godless philosophy that is now being pushed in the schools, whereby if you object to that on the basis that that's not what you want your child to be taught, you want your child to be taught what the, the Bible teaches, then the, the answer that has been given by some government ministers is simply to say parents are ignorant. Parents are ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about when they speak like that. We will tell you what to believe. We will tell you how to behave. We will tell you how to conduct yourself. We will tell you how to raise your children. And if you won't do it our way, then you will be deprived of your children. We will do it for you. That's a dreadful position to be in. But the Lord speaks to the people here and says, you don't have to go along with the rulers. You don't have to go along with those who set the agenda, those who shape the culture. And don't, here's what lies before you. There is a choice that you, the people of the land, you must make that choice and you can't fob it off and say, well, it wasn't really our fault. We didn't have a choice. You do have a choice, the Lord says. And here's the choice. And you'll see the, the language that he uses. This is what the Lord says, I'm setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Um, and there isn't a middle ground. There isn't a kind of easy middle of the ground type of thing where you kind of uh, uh, a little bit in this camp and a little bit in that camp and you just kind of be all things to all people. No, there is a straight choice. Either you go that way or you go the other way. Either you go the way of life or you go the way of death. That's the, the essential choice that is before you. Either you are heading towards life or you are heading towards death. That's as, that's as, as serious, that's as urgent as it could possibly be. And the language, of course, is taken from the, uh, the book of Deuteronomy and the message that Moses directed to the people at the, the very end of his long life. And at the end of that lengthy ministry that he had exercised, when he had led the people out from the land of Egypt, when after um, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, 40 years of teaching them, 40 years of, of training them, 40 years of instructing them in the ways of the Lord, 40 years of preparing them for entering into the land that had been promised to them, 40 years in which he had sought to shape them uh, in the ways of the living God and, and expose them to that which would teach them the way to live in a free and liberated way, true freedom, true life. Uh, 40 years of exposure like that, he says to them, behold, I'm setting before you uh, life and death. Make sure you choose life. Joshua, his successor, exactly the same at the end of his 110 years. This man who had been uh, a slave in Egypt, grown up in Egypt, seen God at work in a powerful way, delivering them out of that bondage, led across the Red Sea, provided for in the wilderness, crossing the River Jordan in the most extraordinary fashion and occupying the land in the face of, of huge forces that were set against them. 
And all those years later, Joshua at the end of his life says, behold, I am setting before you life and death. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve the Lord? Are you going to live for him? Or are you simply going to go with the crowd? Are you going to go with the crowd of nations all around you? Are you simply going to go the way that they want to go because of the pressure to conform from all these nations around you, all these nations crowding and shaping the culture for you? You don't have to follow them. Choose whom you will serve. Is it going to be the Lord and life or is it going to be conformity and destruction? Choose who you will serve. And that's the nature of the choice that is being set before the people here you will see. And the message that is directed therefore to the people, while it is set in these very stark terms that it's, it's that serious an issue, both for them as individuals and as a people. And it's no less urgent and no less serious for ourselves today. And, and if I could speak to the whole people of Scotland today, this is what I would be saying to them. That's, that's the issue. You are at a juncture in the, the long history of this land and of this people and of this nation. You are at a critical, critical juncture. And the only two options that are open to you are life and death. And here's how it's framed by Jeremiah as he brings the word of the Lord to them. Look at what it says. Uh, the Lord says, Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. They will escape with their lives. I have determined to do this city harm and not good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will destroy it with fire. Now, that's the message that was directed to the people of Judah back then. And it, it was not a comfortable message. It was not a message that they expected to hear. It was not a message that they wanted to hear. It was not a message that they were, they were really willing in the end of the day to hear as well. But that was the only message that they had. Those were the terms. And it's important that we understand what the Lord was saying to them. And what he was saying to them is what he says throughout the whole scriptures. And that is simply repent and believe the gospel. That's the bottom line always, not complicated, not, uh, not uh, in any sense difficult to comprehend. You repent and believe the gospel. You turn from your wicked ways and you turn back to the Lord and his ways and the lordship of his son and the grace that is exposed and exercised for us in him. That's the only remedy that there is. And that's why the message of the prophets is, is always along these lines. That's why the message of the whole Bible is always along these lines. See the error of your ways. You are facing abject destruction. What is your only remedy? It is simply to acknowledge that you have blown it. You have messed up good and proper. You have taken the wrong path, made the wrong choices, acted in the wrong sort of way. You have gone the wrong path and your urgent need is to acknowledge that and humbly cry out to the God, turning to him and say, Lord, I, I have messed up good and proper. And so the Lord says, so surrender. And nothing Nothing in all their experience could more graphically exhibit a true humbling of themselves before God than their being willing to surrender to the king of Babylon and to, to give up all the idols in their lives, to give up their city. Because for many of them, the city of Jerusalem had become the be all and end all. As long as we've got the city of Jerusalem, as long as we've got the temple of God, we are okay. We are safe because we have this, peep, this place. We have this city. We have this land. It is our land. And, and it become an idol for them. God says, give it up. 
You're not going to be saved by a city. You're not going to be saved by a temple. That's, that's never, ever going to save you. You're not going to be saved because you are Scottish. You're not going to be saved because you have a certain quality of life. You're not going to be saved because of all the, the income that you have and the money that you may amass and the material things that you have. None of that is going to save you. None of that is going to meet you in your need. You are going to surrender all of that. Surrender yourself to Nebuchadnezzar. That's horrific if you are a Jew. That is, that, is almost, that is almost treasonous, and that's how they viewed Jeremiah. They, they thought this was treason for someone to suggest you actually surrender to the king of Babylon. But the whole point of it is that exhibits a willingness to humble themselves before Almighty God and to say, no matter what you ask me to do, I am obliged to do that because I have messed up good and proper. And, and later, Jeremiah will be speaking from the Lord about Nebuchadnezzar as being God's servant. The most unlikely servant, but, but God says, that's my servant. And I want you to surrender him as, as an expression of your repentance, of your willingness to bow the knee and to do the unthinkable and give up what you have been clinging to all these years. And that's invariably the way that it is with the Lord. He bids a people humble themselves. And there's no deal here that the Lord is, is going to make. There's no kind of room for negotiation. It's not like the Lord says, well, you know, if you, you kind of do that, we can maybe negotiate some sort of settlement. Maybe we'll be able to save the city and things like that. He says, no, um, that city that you are clinging to, that's, that's, that's a goner. That's going to be destroyed. There's kind of too much baggage, too much history. That's, that's, that's past. That's going to be history now. So don't cling to that as though that's going to save you and that's going to be your remedy at all. Um, th there's no deal here. But I'm setting before you life and death. You surrender, you submit, you humble yourself like that, there's life. You don't, you stubbornly stick in and hold firm and, and stand out because somehow you believe that somehow you'll pull through because of, uh, of the past and the way that God has helped you in the past. You stubbornly, perversely stick your ground like that, it's death. There's no future in that. The city will be destroyed, the temple will be destroyed, you'll be destroyed. Here's how it is. You repent, you surrender, you humble yourself. There's life. If you don't, there's death. And, and there's a sense in which this, this is the, the very essence of all that the Bible teaches from beginning to end. You repent and believe the gospel, there is life. You refuse to do that because you are too proud to do that, because you are too eager to hold on to this, that, or the next thing in your life. You refuse to do that because you think it's too costly a thing to do, um, or because it's, it's too embarrassing or too awkward a thing to do. It is death. It's as simple as that, as stark as that, as urgent as that. And always, that's how it's presented to us in the Bible. There's a, there's a, a narrative back in the Old Testament uh, a little bit earlier on, the time of um, uh, the, the prophet Elisha, uh, Elijah rather, where Naaman, who was commander of the army of Aram, that's to say he was a very important guy, uh, a very important guy in the, in the army of the, the enemies of the people of God. And, uh, and this man who uh, had a, a very eminent position a man who had a, a lot of wealth going for him, a lot of material possessions, it would seem, because he was able to, to, to warrant servants in his household. And a man who uh, had done great deeds in battle. He was a commander. He'd done great deeds in battle, highly regarded. But we're told he was a leper. There was this issue in his life for which he didn't have an answer. The, uh, the Aramites didn't have an answer. He wasn't able to provide, uh, no matter how much money he threw in it, the doctors weren't able to solve that and heal him. He had this problem. And, and uh, the servant girl who'd been captured by one of the, the, the raids that he'd undertaken, the servant girl from the land of Israel, says to him, I, I, I know there's a guy in Israel. A guy in Israel who, who brings the grace of God to bear upon people's lives, who speaks the word of God, who brings the grace of God, and through whom the healing power of God is made known. And so Naaman says, yeah, well, let's go. And so they, they head off to the land of Israel and, uh, and are eager to, to know the healing grace of God. And uh, um, uh, he, he comes to the door of the prophet there. 
and uh, he comes seeking the help of Elisha the prophet. And uh, he stands at the door and, and Elisha won't go out to him. Uh, he just sends his servant out with a simple message to, to Naaman, this, this powerful commander who's come with all his retinue, all the trappings of his uh, highly regarded position where he's expected and accustomed to people kind of saluting and, and bowing before him and saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, and that sort of thing. And, and he stands at the door and Elisha won't even come out. The prophet of God won't even come out. And Naaman is, is appalled at that, is, is angry at that. He said, I, I, I deserve a little bit more respect than that. And out comes the servant of Elisha and says to Naaman, he says, so go and wash yourself in the river Jordan seven times and Naaman we're told loses the rag he just blows his top and says uh, you know why are you asking me to do that I'm not going to go down into the river Jordan I'm not going to go down in that muddy river like that we've got enough rivers in our own land if I wanted to go in a river I would go in a river in one of our own lands one of those great rivers that we have far far better than the stinking muddy waters of the river Jordan and uh, and his seven wisely says to him, uh, uh, kind of um, you know it's, it's not a complicated thing that the, 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 the prophet is asking you to do just go but here's a proud, proud man who is angry that he stood at the door and the prophet won't come and actually address him himself, but sends his servant. How humiliating is that? This man is being called by God to repent, is being called by God to, to, to show a measure of humility before Almighty God and to acknowledge, I cannot save myself, no matter how much strength I may have, no matter how much money I may have, no matter how much exploits I may have, nothing that I can do can heal me and can save me. And acknowledge that, Naaman. Do what I say. Go down into that river. You think it's muddy, you think it's murky, and it is muddy and it is murky because it's the river that stands for that repentance whereby people have gone in with all the mud in their lives and the sinfulness and waywardness of their lives and they have gone down and it has been muddied by the sins of men and women. Go and muddy it with your own sin. Get in there and acknowledge that's where you belong. That's who you are. You are a muddied individual. You may be highly regarded. You may be highly respected. You may have a lot of affluence and so on. But bottom line before Almighty God, you are filthy. Get down there and acknowledge that. Because that's the only remedy there is. And eventually the guy shrugs his shoulders and says, well, okay, I'll go do it. And he goes in and dips himself these seven times. Again and again and again goes down into those muddy, muddy, dirty, stinking waters. And he comes up a new man. He comes up cleansed because he has surrendered. He has submitted to the word of God. He has done what God has called him to do and he has humbly repented before almighty God and has turned from seeking to destroy the people of God to a man who now will honor the God of the people of God. He is a new man. And that's the message Jeremiah is bringing to the people of Judah at this time. Not a complicated message, he says. But we don't have the time now to, to mess around with flowery words the message is simply, it's just surrender. It's life or death. Either you humble yourselves before God himself and before this man who is God's servant at this time. The one who is bringing the message of God in the only language that you seem able to understand now, people of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar, I want you to surrender to him because I mean you to surrender to me and to acknowledge there is no life, no hope outside of me, says the Lord. I am the Lord who made you. I am the Lord who's loved you. I am the Lord who has sent to you again and again my messengers with my word because I have pity on you. I am the Lord who alone is able to rescue. Humble yourselves, therefore, before this God. Repent, mend your ways, believe that gospel, that good news that I have brought to you in Jesus Christ. Declare to you and pronounce to you in him. There is life in him. Turn to him and live. 
And that's, that's the message to the people of this land today. None of us know how, how things will turn out beyond this lockdown. None of us know what that, that new normal is going to be like, other than the fact that it's, it's not going to be what we, we would have recognized as normal in the past. It may well be a very, very different world. And we, we, we do not have the liberty of clinging to the past. The Lord says, surrender. The Lord says, humble yourselves. Recognize the folly of this culture that is being thrust upon you, that has been imposed and shaped and laid upon you over all these years. See the damage that it has been doing. See the devastating consequences right across the spectrum of society's life. See the folly of your ways. Humble yourselves before God. Turn to him and live. That's the urgency of the message in these days. I set before you, says the Lord, the way of life and the way of death. Surrender and live. Stick your feet in stubbornly. Stand your ground. You die. It is always a gospel summons to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and to find in him our life and our freedom. May God bless his word to our hearts and to the hearts of the people of our land in these days by his Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God, our Father, how, how I'd, I'd want to pray simply that you would release your word and you would speak your word by your spirit into the nation in these days in such a manner that there may be just that that great weight of conviction of sin laid upon us that we might see that for all the the ways in which those who are the rulers today have shaped the culture and done so in ways that, that often present as being very flowery and very important and very significant, that it's been ruinous for us. And even though you have in your pity sent messengers again and again and again down these years, we, we as a people have just increasingly simply scorned that message, scoffed at the messengers, despised your word have mercy upon us god our father and grant that in these days strange and significant as they are we might yet in your kind mercy we might yet hear and heed your word that we might turn from our wicked ways turn to the one who alone can rescue us and save us and in him find life in its fullness. Father, only you can do that. Only you can open hearts, open eyes, open minds, open lives. Only you can do that. Only you can make men and women who are dead alive. Would you, would you open the eyes of the blind, Father? Would you unstop the ears of the deaf? And would you, would you do that in our hearts as well? That we might ourselves be a people who humble before yourself discover all over again the richness of your grace and mercy to us in Jesus Christ your son through whom we ask it all amen well as our closing praise then let's take these words of the song king of kings majesty let's take these words make them our own and our own response to the lord we we bow before him and say lord you are king and in you alone is our life king of kings majesty
You would maybe have seen uh, just prior to the start of our service this evening that note about Christianity Explored, which begins uh, immediately after this service now at uh, quarter to eight for an hour over the next seven weeks. Uh, if you would like to be um, involved in that and share in that, do just let us know and we can certainly incorporate you into that uh, as of this evening. So do, um, do get in touch if you would like to follow through on that. Uh, on Tuesday of this week, we have our regular lunchtime service at 12.45, and we'll be simply following through the relevant bits of Mark's gospel that Christianity Explored will be working at week by week over the next seven weeks. We'll be looking at Mark's gospel on a Tuesday lunchtime, and uh, you're always very welcome at that service of worship as well, a half hour on a Tuesday been good to have you with us this evening. May you know God's blessing and God's favor, God's presence and God's enabling and all that these coming days will bring for you. Go then in his peace and may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest on and remain with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>